That's a good one. I got applause for that one last night too. So, and they weren't awake. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm telling on last night's service, I had more people fall asleep during last night's sermon than any other time. So just prepare for that. I don't know why I told you that, but <clears throat> there it is. So the launch is not till 1030 at least now. So you can relax. It means pastor can talk for an extra 20 minutes this morning. <laughs> just kidding. So it's true. A lot of times we wear masks. We try to pretend we're somebody we're not. Um, in some cases, we don't pretend. We just want to be left alone. And uh, uh, I'm a member of a gym where no one talks to anybody. That's the new thing in, in gyms. I've actually uh, been a part of uh, uh, four different gyms now in the last few years. And it's funny to see people walk in, put their headphones in, and it really stands out when there's people that pull their headphones out and talk to people. That is the rarity in our world today. And so here's what's funny about that. Those people who won't talk to other people would not say they're wearing a mask. They're just avoiding people. And I honestly think in our society, that's part of what's happening. Is It's not that we are being fake. We're just being non-existent. Um, we're not taking time to get to know people. We're not getting into small groups. And uh, I mean as a society. Now, here's what's awesome. This week we had three families stay with us next door from Family Promise who are without housing. And our prayer and hope and goal for them is to work with Family Promise and to give them a hand up and get them into housing. Over 35 people helped to be a part of that. And that's you guys reaching out to other people and uh, serving others in our community. And you don't have to do that, but you do. And so I'm grateful for that. Some churches have to pull teeth to get people to help. We only have to slightly aggravate you and then you help. Uh, but it's good. And of course, there's never enough people. You have to understand as a pastor, I, I remember years ago, I talked to a car dealer and I said, have you sold enough cars this month? And he said to me, never enough. Never enough. And I thought, that's really funny because pastors are the same way. We have something happen. We get people to work. We serve in that area. And as soon as we have enough people, we go, well, we got enough people. We got to start another thing that they can serve at the two. So, you know, there's never enough. Why? Because we want to see people's lives change. So we always have that heart. Now, I don't know today if you, uh, this message is going to start out a little tough and then you're going to love the ending. But we need both sides of it, and this is going to, we're going to look at Romans chapter uh, 3 and 4 today. And um, <clears throat> here's one thing I know. We're going to talk today about how to walk in faith. And I would love it if the Christian life was just a checklist, where you just had a piece of paper, and you said, here's the six things. If I do these six things, then I'm walking in faith, and if I don't, I'm not. Um, I'm really going to give you three things today, but the three things you'll see entail a little more. Now, I don't know if you remember, but I remember one of the first times I used GPS. How many of you in here have ever used GPS in your car to get you somewhere, right? All right. How many of you use GPS regularly? Use it often. Wow. Okay. You're, you're much better than last night already. You guys get extra credit. They just looked at me like they had, didn't they? Did you, you remember that last time? You, did you fall asleep during that time too? Okay. But anyway... So the praise team comes Saturday and Sunday. That's why I pick on them. But um, so one of the first times I used GPS, I had done a, a golf retreat. Talk about an awesome gig. One of the nicest golf courses in Florida over in Tampa. And I did a golf retreat. I'm a horrible golfer, which is hilarious. You should see me play. But I play what I call grace golf, which means that I don't care. I will pick the ball up, I will carry it to the hole and put it in, but I also will not brag about my score. So I always tell people, don't worry, I'm not in competition with you. When you hit it too far, I'm just going to pick my ball up and walk to where you are and drop it right there. That's grace golf. That's what Jesus did for us. But anyway, so, so I, uh, I had the GPS and so I needed to come back home. And so I programmed in uh, home and... Um, and I got on the way I knew to go home on 75, and I knew I needed to go 75, and then I can't even remember what road I had to get on, and then eventually I was going to get on 408 and 50 or something. I don't, I don't remember. It's been a long time ago. I'm old. So I start going, and the GPS starts saying, turn around. And I'm looking. I'm like, no, no, it's going to figure out that I'm going the right way. 
to the point that I muted the GPS and told it, you don't know what you're talking about, mute. I, I must have programmed in something wrong, and I didn't have time to look for it. And, uh, uh, and I was in a hurry, right? So I was just going until I saw Gainesville next exit. And then I realized the GPS has been right all along, and I've been wrong. And instead of getting in home in a hurry, I was several hours later than I would have been. And then, of course, I had church the next day and all that fun stuff. It was very exciting. So I say that to say this. It is easy in our own thoughts, in our own mind, to think that we're walking in faith. It's easy in our own minds to think we're going the right direction. And we can fool ourselves like we talked about last week. And we can fool other people like the video talks about. But the truth is, we can be off track and not know it. So today, Paul talks to the early church and he's already talked to the Greeks in the chapter 1, and he basically says, hey, you keep doing all these things, and you, you think, say you're following God, and you're not. And then in chapter 2, he says, you know, you think because you have Jewish heritage that somehow that makes you have everything right, and you don't. So he's made everybody feel bad the first two chapters, kind of saying, hey, you can't earn your way to God. And then in chapter 3, the transition begins to happen. One of the most famous scriptures uh, uh, in uh, Romans is Romans 3.23, which says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, or in one of the translations said, of God's glorious ideal. So we're going to pick up in chapter 3 today, and I'm going to give you three things. I promise you, you won't like the first one, but it's good for you. Okay? So this is the first one is your vegetables for the day, your exercise for the day. I'm trying to think of what else you don't like that's good for you. It's making your bed for the day. All right, so here we go. Some of you are like, making the bed. I love making the bed. Oh, so today we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about repenting, recognizing his righteousness, and rekindling my hope. So here's number one. Repent of my sins and failures. Romans 3, we're picking up in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by, listen, the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Forgive me for just a I hate to do that with the microphone on. All right. So through the law, we become conscious of sin. Here's the deal. If we make our own rules, our own rules typically fit what we do. We're like Charlie Brown with the target practice. Do you ever see Charlie Brown target practice? I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you haven't seen it, Charlie Brown shoots an arrow, uh, hits the wall, goes over to the wall, draws the target around the arrow. Okay, Lots of us are like that. We, we don't really know what's right and what's wrong. So how do we decide? Well, in our society, we have options. We can go by how we feel. And so if we feel like doing something, that makes it right. And if we don't feel like doing something, that makes it wrong. We can do it by loving. If we're just loving, that's all that matters. Of course, the definition of loving to some people is different than others, right? We can let the government decide what right and wrong is. Anybody vie for that one? No, okay. <clears throat> I, I'm sorry, i got to say this. It's, I don't talk about politics a lot, but one politician calling another one corrupt just makes me laugh. All right, okay. So, it's like, <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. I just had to throw that out there. It's the only thing you'll hear from me this week. All right, <clears throat> so, so, so how do we decide? Well, we believe as a church and we believe as individuals, we go back to God's word and we say, God, what is right and wrong? And, and the truth is, even just following Jesus' two commands can be difficult. Love God with everything. You ever go through a week and you're headed to church and, you're, and you realize that you haven't prayed since you left church? You ever go through a week and, and you went to church the week before and now you're, you're going to church the next week and as you're on the way there you realize you hadn't really prayed for anybody but you? It's real easy to think that we love God with all our heart and we don't make him priority. Are you already feeling vegetables. Is that what I'm hearing? I feel it. Right? But it's true. It, we think that we love God with all our heart, but the truth is in, in, in what we do, number two, he said the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everybody thinks they're loving. Everybody thinks they're loving. And all you have to do is get in line at Publix behind a couponer to realize you're not as loving as you think you are. 
I'm not going to have you raise your hand if you're a couponer. I want you to know I love you when you're behind me. <laughs> right? And so, so the truth is for all of us, we, listen, just those two commands. If we're honest about it, just those two things. We need to recognize that we fail and we fall. And the good news is, in the law, the whole purpose of the law is so that we realize that. You can't earn your way to God. You can't do enough good things. It's too unreachable. Like I talked about last week, it's like a competition to swim to Hawaii. Get in the boat. And so Jesus is the boat. We can't make it. And the truth is, sometimes, even as believers, we need to wake up in the morning and recognize our failures. Not so that we can go around going, I'm such a failure. You know, God's not trying to raise a bunch of Eeyores. That's what happens when you're me. Right? But the truth is, we have to recognize it. You know why? So we can realize how good God is. And how good God is to us. So let me ask you the first question. Do I spend daily time in God's word and, oh, excuse me, that's the, that's the last question. I'll start at the beginning. Am I conscious of my own failures and sins? In Psalms 34, verse 8, it says, taste and see that God is good. And I remember years ago, a pastor who I loved named Dave Busby, he's gone to be with the Lord. He had polio. And he was an incredible youth speaker. And I remember going to see him. And I remember he did a sermon called Taste and See. And he talked about how we need to taste and see how good God is. But in order to understand how good God is, sometimes we need to taste and see how utterly we fail and falter. How we mess up. Because it makes God so much better. When you eat vegetables... And then you have silk pie. Oh, the silk pie is so good. Right? I went to Village Inn this week with Lydia. And it just happened to be free pie day. Although I had ordered a full meal and was full, I, she came up to the table. And she said, do you want any dessert? I said, no, no. Nay, nay. I cannot eat dessert. I am already chubby enough. Thank you. Baymax is in the house. And she said, but it's free today. One for her, one for me. Thank you. <laughs> Lydia looks at me. She goes, I don't eat pie. I go, you're taking it home. <laughs> and boy, it was good. That silk pie came. Oh, I thought the hamburger was good till I had silk pie. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes when we taste and see our failures and our failings and we take time to repent, the word repent means a change of mind. It means admitting that I'm wrong. Then we realize how good God is. And listen, we need to take time every day to let God evaluate our hearts through the Holy Spirit. He'll speak to you. Now listen, he could show up and speak to you audibly. But most likely, he's just going to give you impressions. And oftentimes, the impressions you get, listen, and people say, how do I know it's God? Because usually, it's an unselfish thought. Because we tend to think about selfishness and ourselves. And when God shows up in our lives to speak to us, it's something like, you know, when you talked to so-and-so, you were a little rude. Or you know, you made a big deal out of this, and it's not. You know, Eric, when you got on I-4 today... Oh. I was on I-4, I think, nine times this week. The tenth time I couldn't take I-4, it was backed up so bad I had to take back roads. It was so exciting. And so I have to say, Lord, I want to say Jesus take the wheel and ram into those people. <laughs> but instead I try to walk in that. Now let me, I, every week I want to tell you a little something about Romans, since it's the book of Romans. In the time the book of Romans was written, you have to realize in the time of Christ... Rome had what they called Pax Romana, a time of peace. They finally had an emperor that when he took over, it created peace. But not long after that emperor, emperors came that were the opposite of peace. And the main one we think of is Nero. Um, there's a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs written during the time of Nero, most of it. And it's stories 
horrible, worse than any graphic novel you've ever read, horrible stories of Christians who died for their faith during the time of Nero. So Romans was written a little bit before or maybe at the beginning of that time when things started to change, when all of a sudden there was an uprising, when all of a sudden Christians started to be persecuted. They went from having freedom to being persecuted, and God even used that. Because as the Christians were persecuted, they began to leave where they were and go, and everywhere they went, they told people about Jesus. So they didn't just stay in Jerusalem. They didn't just stay in Roman territory. They spread and went all over the world. And so we're Christians today because of that influence. And so Paul is writing to this early church and saying, here's some dangers. And people believe that you can know just about everything you need to know about faith in the book of Romans. And that's why we're going through it today. All right, so let's continue. Number two, not only do I repent of my sins and failures, number two, I recognize my righteousness, to which in your little mind you might hear, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> you have any idea what I'm talking about? I'm glad you do. I'm sure some of the young people won't know. My son would be like, what is that? Well, he's seen it in reruns, so. What you talking about, Willis? You remember that? You have no idea? Different strokes. You know, it takes different strokes to change the world. Anyway, um, so, so you go from recognize my sin to recognize my righteousness. Here's the thing. People don't understand this. They don't know what to do with this. Let me, let me give you what it means. Positionally, when you give your life to Christ, you inherit his holiness. Practically, you don't always live in who you are. This is who you are. This is what you do sometimes. But this is who you are. This does not make you who you are. That's the good news. But we have to repent and say, God, forgive me for not being who I am. So let's listen to the verse. Here we go. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and prophets testify. So Paul's saying the Old Testament was talking about this. Even in the Old Testament, it wasn't by the law. And then he continues, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned. This is that famous verse. And fall short of the glory of God. And all, what happens next? They're justified freely by his grace through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. I think about Christmas time. Every year there's a guy, and they don't know exactly who it is, who goes to the different layaways at Walmart. And he'll walk up and say, do you have a family with three kids that has a layaway? And then he pays off whatever their debt is. They don't know him. He doesn't know them. He just gives them a free gift to different families every year. Just pays off their debt, pays off their debt, pays off their debt. That's what Jesus did for us. You can't earn your way to God. You can't do enough good things. You can't light enough candles. You can't come to enough church services. You can't give enough money. I wish that wasn't true. You can't give enough money. You can't, right? Right? You can't, all these things aren't pulling you closer to God. You know what does? The death of Jesus Christ. And when you receive that freely by his grace, you now receive his righteousness. Not because of anything you did. And that righteousness is guaranteed even when practically you mess up and blow it. Now, I will say this. If you live here and you pursue unrighteousness and you pursue sin, then 1 John says you probably aren't here. If all you want to do is pursue an unrighteous lifestyle, if all you do is want to tell people, this is how I'm going to live, leave me alone. If you want to look at God and say, I want nothing to do with you, then you'll probably have never really received the grace of Jesus. Because when you receive the grace of Jesus, when over here in the practical, you mess up and you blow it, the Holy Spirit convicts you and you say, God, forgive me for sinning, for blowing it. I want to walk in your righteousness. When's the last time you thanked God for making you righteous? 
Let me read you a verse about how good God is to us, if you haven't read this one. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When's the last time you just said, God, I can do anything you want me to do. Why? Because you've given me your strength. So let me ask you this question. Am I aware of my righteousness through Christ? You no longer have to get up and say, I'm a sinner. You can say, I was a sinner. If you're a Christian, you can say, I was a sinner, but now I'm saved by grace. I used to be a sinner. I used to walk in sin. I used to pursue sin. That doesn't mean I never sin, but who I am is not a sinner. I am now made righteous in Christ. Now, that sounds like a subtle difference, but it's a big deal in how we think. Have you received his righteousness? Number three, rekindle my hope and belief. Rekindle my hope and belief. Now, if you've ever taken a golf lesson or a music lesson, one of the things you realize is when you first learn to play, you're very conscious of all the lesson you just got. So when I first learned how to play guitar, I was conscious of where my fa- and, and I was horrible. I'm still not very good. Guitarists know I fake it. Amen. So when I first took a golf lesson, same way, they tell you 43 things to do. Keep your shoulders straight. Keep your back straight. They may, hold the club tight, but not too tight. Keep your arms straight, but loosen up. Keep your high on the ball, but then watch it fly. What? So you sit down and you go to hit, and guess what happens when you first do that? You hit it the wrong way every time. Why? Because your eyes are on you. But as it becomes more normal in your life, it just becomes a habit. My hope for you is that this idea of hope and belief would become a habit in your life as you pursue it. Listen to what it says here. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Some of us feel exactly like that, right? When you wake up in the morning and you're noisy... You know that, right? Since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Well, there's a nice quote there, Paul. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. Did you know God can do what he's promised for you? This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The word it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but for us also. To whom God will credit righteousness. But Eric, I don't always act righteous. He credits it to you. Why? For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So he died for our sins, and when he came back alive, he justified us. And that word justified means just as if I had never sinned. Which is remarkable, because if you've hung around me, you know that the pastor sins. If you haven't hung around me, you think, well, he's pretty, he seems pretty together on Sunday morning. Yeah, half hour. And actually, if you've been here for a half hour, you start to go, I'm not so sure he should be the pastor. I'm not. <laughs> actually, I said that this morning to somebody. Anyway, so, so, but the truth is, listen, we all, people come to me and go, Eric, you're a really positive person. No, I'm not. I'm full of hope. And you know why I'm full of hope? Because I spend time in God's word and in prayer. And I want to add one other thing to this. Do I spend time daily in God's word and prayer and singing songs of praise? Because here's the deal. When you're discouraged and you're down and you're dealing with things that are beyond you, sometimes a song is the thing that draws you back to God's presence. That that reminds you of God's word. Our, our, Our verses for our songs come from the Bible. And so it's a way of singing and remembering God's word. It's been done since the earliest times, uh, Jewish times. You, You sing a song about God and it draws you back. If you really want to do these three things, look at repentance in your life. Look at the idea of believing in his righteousness and then and then building hope through that. Then you have to spend time daily in God's word. You have to spend time in prayer. And then when we gather as believers, these coals come together and make a fire. You don't have to come to church to be a Christian. But if you're going to be a growing Christian, you have to be a part of a fellowship where people can know you. You can encourage them, serve with them, and you can be encouraged by them. 
You can't please God by works. You can't keep yourself from falling enough to please God. But you can repent and say, God, I don't deserve your love. And then recognize that he gives you his righteousness anyway. And then that rekindles your hope and belief. To walk in faith each day, do these three things. Repent, recognize, and rekindle. Repent, recognize, and rekindle. So this week, during the day, and as you think back, just think. And you, and you may not remember them this way. Maybe you'll remember them from a story I told. But I want to encourage you. Take time each day. To ask God, God, show me anything in my life, any area of my life where I don't agree with you. That's repentance. Recognize. Recognize his righteousness. God, thank you that you've made me righteous. I don't deserve it. By the way, that'll keep you humble. And then rekindle that hope. Understanding that he's not done with you yet. We have the hope of heaven, but we also have the hope that he's still working on us. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ... You can do that today. We don't do a formal invitation where people come down an aisle, but I'll be here after the service. And you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. You may be here, and one of the things I talked about, you're very aware that you struggle with. Well, confess it to God. Make it right. Maybe for you, it feels weird to say that you're righteous in Jesus. Well, you may have to get up in the morning and go, I am righteous. That's okay. You can be like the turtle. Righteous. Every morning. Remind yourself that you've been made righteous in him. Every day, every day. And then ask him to rekindle that hope. If you've lost hope, if you've lost your fire for life, ask God, God, would you renew that in me? And that only happens when you get your eyes off of you, you put your eyes on him, and then he'll use you to bless others. Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your power and your strength. Lord, I thank you for all the people serving out at the launch site this morning. And I know the launch keeps getting pushed back. So, Father, I pray you'd be with them. Many of them can't go to church today. So, Father, would you show them your love even as they're just waiting at this point? Father, I pray too for each one here. I pray for that one who doesn't know you yet, that today might be the day they surrender to you. Lord, I also pray for those of us who are, as we're listening to this, we're either struggling with a sin in our lives or, or Father, with receiving your love. We begin to think that we are not worthy of your love, and it's true, but you give it to us anyway. So help us to receive your love and your righteousness to renew our hope in you. We thank you for these moments. Thank you for your blood that cleanses us from all sin and renews us. Do that today, even as we sing this song. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great song.